And um, we'll kind of pick up here in Deuteronomy where we left off, Deuteronomy 29. We had been reading over these different things about the curses and blessings. And um, I wanted to back up just a little bit and look at verse uh, 29 of chapter 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. I got so busy chasing my tail this week that I forgot to get a video. I want to get a, a slide up here of the difference between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. So Lord willing, I'll get that for next time. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to, like I said, stand there and see the two mountains standing next to each other. And how in the world there can be one with this giant stone boulders all over it. Uh, and then the other one have all kinds of beautiful green trees growing all over it, side by side like that. Only God knows how he did that after Noah's flood. But uh, it's still that way to this day. And so... Uh, Moses has re rehearsed for the people the reading of the curses in the law and the reading of the blessings in the law. But I wanted to zoom in on this little thing in verse 29 because I just read it and didn't really expound on it too much. Because the Bible does speak about how God's secret is with the righteous. And so uh, since we have so many secret societies in America, and they have formed a uh, big part of where the whole world's going as far as the New World Order. Uh, many of our friends are members of secret societies like the Masonic Lodge or the Eastern Stars or Ladies Branch yeah, and so forth, so on. And uh, we've learned over the years, you know, you can easily learn a little bit of some of their secrets because that's why they're a secret society. They boast that they have hidden knowledge. This is an old thing of the devil. Uh, he's tried to pull this off for centuries and got people to buy into wickedness and sinfulness because he says, oh, he's going to teach you some secrets that other people don't know. And uh, so Satan has utilized this to get people to join his ranks. We know the Masonic Lodge, the members themselves, that there's different ranks, supposedly, uh, of uh, the Masonic Lodge. Most of us, uh, my father-in-law, He's just an old hillbilly. He, he, I don't even think he had a, a high school diploma. And um, uh, he stuffed hot dogs in downtown Detroit for a living, worked in a the factory there. But yet he joined the Masonic Lodge because, you know, before he was a Christian man, he just played uh, guitar music in bars. <laughs> That's where he met his wife. And... Uh, him and another guy fought over this woman and he ended up the winner. <laughs> and, uh, and that was Joy's parents. They ended up getting saved, praise the Lord, and getting in church, see, learning to sing for God. And that was wonderful. But uh, I'm sure he just joined because uh, he wanted to be something and everybody told him as a dummy from Tennessee that you ain't nobody unless you're a Masonic Lodge member. So he joined, paid his dues, and uh, so he could say he was one of them hoping it would give him some advancement uh, in, you know, in society and he could get a good job and keep it. And, uh, and that's, you, most people's the long short of it. They belong to the Blue Lodge, you know, or this, that. They have different names, and this, or the Scottish Rite, or whatever. And then once you get in there, though, there are a bunch of people that have, uh, that then that they can buy into and become a 32nd degree Mason but you're never a Shriner unless you're a 33 degree Mason. And the truth is, once you're in, you're in, and then they only sell a 32 degree or a 33rd degree. But now the Masonic Lodge Shriners are the 33rd degree. And it's just another, it's just another position they can buy into. And, uh, and they have lodge meetings and so forth and so on, but it's almost like the Fred Flintstone thing. You know, if you're a member of the Grand Poobah or whatever, and wear your hat and go to the meeting. <laughs> you can be something in that group. Or you can just join it and never go to any of the meetings. And that's what most people do, let's be honest. 
and the, yet they say it's a mostly businessmen, and then of course they do sponsor some Shriners hospitals around the country for burn patients, and that's wonderful, and that is a good thing. You know, it's wonderful that there's hospitals, because they got to do something to make up for number one all the liquor that goes on in their parties and stuff, and then number two all the homosexuality goes on amongst them, and then number three they're known to be a wife swapping outfit, and so all this wickedness and lewdness. Now again to become this third degree. 33rd degree Masonic Lodge member, you have to lay in a coffin naked. You know, if you're into it, you have to lay in a coffin naked. Then you have to put on a, put on a uh, sort of like a, a black monk's robe and uh, put the hood on and walk around and, and participate in a meeting and you stand here, stand there, say this, do that. And then you have to take a fake skull and they give you some fake blood, it's probably just wine, and you drink that uh, out of the fake skull uh, to, to get to 33 degrees. So when I told my friend all this, and he's a 33 degree member, he got a little bit interested because he knew these were secrets that nobody's supposed to know. And I'm telling him he did all these things, and now that he's a Christian, he should repudiate those things, that these things were of the devil. And when I told him that if he wanted to join the, the Satan group in our county, all he had to do is do the same things, except this time drink real blood out of a real skull, and that's the only difference, and he could join the local coven in our county and become a Satanist. He immediately got his 33 degree Shriners ring, took it off, Bound, he, 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 he bound it up, he folded it up in a, in a work vice, and then as a state cop driving down the road, he just threw it out the window and got rid of it. <laughs> and he renounced the devil and all his works, the way Paul said to in 2 Corinthians. He said, Lord, I don't want nothing to do with that. You know I was lost when I did all that, and I don't in any way want to be associated with anything like that so please Lord forgive me and that's wonderful the Lord is that forgiving yeah. and it's that easy to get out of it Amen. if you want to get out of it <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> and so God is gracious and he's a God of a second and third chance and so we need to talk a little bit about this verse uh, Deuteronomy 29 29 the secret things belong unto the Lord our God amen now, there are some things God's got secret. God don't have to tell us everything. He don't owe us nothing. Amen? We're just reprobate creatures of his, sinners. <laughs> and um, he's the creator. He knows all things because he made it all. Now, it's wonderful that over the centuries, he has revealed some of his secrets to us. Uh, Louis Pasteur was a Christian man, and he studied and studied. He knew based on the Bible that there's more to, to health than meets the eye. And God bless him, he finally figured out how you could take and make a vaccine and you could take and uh, make penicillin and you could take and, and uh, uh, wash your hands in running water and different things. And pretty soon he discovered you know, germs and microbes and bacteria. And praise the Lord, we're all healthier today because Louis Pasteur was a Christian man who believed the Bible, knew that God made it all, and knew that probably there was more than we knew. And God had laws of sanitation in the Bible. And uh, so some of these secret things, like little tiny microorganisms, like microbes and viruses and bacteria, uh, he's shown us over the centuries. And it's, uh, most of the great discoveries have been by Christian men that love God and believe that God in the Bible uh, would and wants to show us some things so that we can better ourselves to his glory. To quote Johann Sebastian Bach that he wrote at the end of the bottom of every page of every song he ever wrote, to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. What good is music if it ain't to the glory of God? Have you listened to any of this music that's not written to the glory of God? It's pretty wicked. It's pretty filthy. Amen? So God does reveal the secrets, and especially the secrets of his word. See? And he reveals them to prophets, doesn't he? Let's look at Amos 3.7. 
Amos 3.7. Now right here, we probably would do well to remind ourselves of the book of the Bi books of the Bible. I've talked about this lately. And last night, even at the nursing home, I stopped and said, let's say the books of the Bible. And it wasn't too, the, I was, me and Joy were probably just pretty well saying them by ourselves. <laughs> Which is okay. I mean, because as we've said before, how many of us have gone to Bible college even? And here we are, we're in this august room of, oh my, at least 500 kids. I was in a room of 500 kids. And we're all struggling to say the books of the Bible, my first year of Bible college. Listen, if you're claiming to be a preacher, and of course I love challenging my friends at the old folks' home, because of course they have Jehovah Witness ladies come in there, and <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Methodist preacher ladies come in there, and, and um, a lot of Catholic priests coming in there. And I said, just ask a Catholic priest sometime to rattle off the books of the Bible for you. Let's see if he knows them. How can anybody represent God and not even know the books of the Bible? <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard to learn them, amen? amen? And yet even us as Christians, how, do we know them? We ought to know them because, again, how can we turn to them and help find things for other people if we don't even know the books of the Bible? So let's say Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Amen? <laughs> now you can just turn to the front of the Bible and read them off. They're all right there in the table of contents. Amen? And then the New Testament, of course, we're big on being a New Testament church, amen? And the books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Now see? If you know your books of the Bible, you can find them faster. If someone comes up to you and asks you a question, well, you'll know if there's an address they're looking for, you can help them find it quick. Amen? So we should at least know the books of the Bible, don't you think? And then there are some key verses we should learn. Anybody that's been saved more than, I'll say, five years should know John 3, 16. Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen? That is so important because that's really telling you how to be saved. <laughs> how you need to believe on the Lord Jesus and how God's going to give you that eternal everlasting life. And it happens when you believe on him because he wants you to be saved from hell and going to heaven. <laughs> and yet I'm saying there's a lot of preachers you could ask them, could you quote me John 3.16? And they'll stumble and stammer at it because they don't know it. And that's sad. So Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Here we see that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Amen? Amen. There's some things about a prophet. A prophet speaks for God. A prophet can speak for the word of God as it tells us the future of all men and if you're going to go to heaven or go to hell. Like I said last week, uh, you believe in race, don't you? Don't you believe in race? What is race? Well, that's something evolutionists talk about, but it's nowhere in the Bible. But like I heard a black preacher say last week on the radio, and I love him dearly, he's a friend of ours. He said, every man's in a race in this world if you're a part of God's human race, amen, 
and you're racing to heaven or you're racing to hell. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. And who are God's prophets? Well, they tell the prophecy. They stand up for God. A true prophet believes the word and this and how that the word is the preserved words of God and he stands up and knows the words of God. Amen. So many people call themselves a preacher because they can open the Bible, have a little Bible study somewhere and tell people they're having church and it's not church. It's just a Bible study. There's a difference. There's seven things you got to have to be a church. Number one is you got to be singing songs because Jesus said in Hebrews 2 and then in verse 12 that he's there singing in the midst of the congregation. So you got to have music. Or you ain't having church yet. Because Jesus said in Hebrews 2.12 that he sings from the midst of his church. From the midst of the congregation. So you got to have singing. Some people say, well, doesn't the Bible say we're two, three gathered together and there am I in the midst? He says, yeah, that's what it does say. Yes, sir. It does say that. And there is more to meeting with people and talking about God than just watching it on the computer or on television. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> And the Lord has a way of showing up when people are in flesh and blood sitting down and having Bible study. Amen. But that still ain't church. That's the point I'm making. There's seven things the Bible teaches. And we'll be getting into it as we get in Corinthians here because Corinthians, Paul does get into it, how that you got to lay aside on the first day of the week your money. There has to be a collection or you're not having church. You can have Bible study all day, but if you ain't laying your money by and store for the Lord... You have to have a collection. It's impossible to be a church without having collection. But now some, I think you'll agree with me, most churches overemphasize taking that collection and wanting to get your money. And some of them, that's all they talk about. God save us. Um, they meet on Sunday. Paul's going to lay that out in Corinthians, how it meets on the first day of the week. Now, I have a good friend, uh, some of you would know him well. He's a very famous person in America, Christian man. And his boast and brag when you know him personally and he tells you the honest to God truth over in California, the church he pastors, he calls it a church because they meet and have Bible study. But they meet on Monday. They never meet on Sunday because why would you meet on Sunday when that's when all the big street preaching gigs are and the sporting events. And so they go to all the sporting events and preach and and protest and do all kinds of things on Sunday. But they never meet to have church but on Mondays. Well, that's not a New Testament church. It might be a Monday Bible study. <laughs> but it's not a church. Because again, the Bible does lay out the seven things you've got to be to be a church. And so among his prophets, his, the prophets should know his secrets, don't you think? And God reveals the secrets of his word to his prophets. He also sometimes on occasion will reveal them to kings. Let's look at Daniel. Look at the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 18. Daniel 2, 18, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning his, this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And here, you know, Daniel's able to tell the king his dream. Amen. Verse 21. And he changes the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. And he revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Amen. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desire of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So, God wants kings to know his secrets at times, so he reveals them to his prophets, and his prophets in turn tell the kings. And in that occasion, God had given the king a dream, uh, but he couldn't figure it out by himself, though God had given it to him, and so God uses Daniel to explain it to him so he would get the correct 
understanding of it. Amen? So God, uh, God reveals the secrets of his word to prophets. He reveals them to kings. And, and uh, he reveals them to his friends. <laughs> Amen? Which is totally right. And just like you have some secrets, I hope. And only your trusted friends are allowed to know some of your secrets. And so Jesus tells us in John 15, 15, when he had the disciples with him, that he had reached a point. And this is so neat when you read your New Testament and learn these things about Jesus' disciples. As Jesus was going along, uh, after he finally had turned 30 years old, uh, it was time for him to start preaching. So he left the family business, gave it to his brother. And his brother kind of resented it, his brother James. And, uh, <laughs> and um, he started preaching. And uh, after his cousin John the Baptist had baptized him, it was time for him to start preaching. And so Jesus uh, began to preach, and he chose 12 men. The Bible tells us in detail how he chose them. And uh, he trained them. And as he was training them, they were his followers. That's what the word disciple means. They were just followers of Jesus. But then finally, near the end, uh, he said this to him in John 15, 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things. That's the key word there, all. Amen. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. See, a friend lets their friend in on all things. <laughs> I have acquaintances, and I have friends. Amen. And you have friends. And you have acquaintances. Amen. And Jesus called his disciples his friends. And of course, before it's over, Jesus will even send them out as his apostles. Because now once they've been discipled, and it took him three and a half years to disciple them, then finally now they were ready to take the gospel out on their own without his presence, without him being there. He would go on up to the Father and sit at the right hand of the Father. And he would be with them in spirit only, amen. The spirit of Jesus was upon them. And they would go out now as his sent ones. That's what the word apostle meant, means. He sent them out. They had been through their discipleship training, and now they're no longer disciples. Now they're apostles, and they are missionaries. That's the Latin word for apostle, missionaries. So God reveals the secrets of his word to prophets, to kings, to friends, and God-fearing students of the word of God. Amen. You, as a Bible-believing Christian, God's going to show you more things then he will, you know, Joe Sixpack. <laughs> Look at Isaiah 66 and verse 2. Isaiah 66 and verse 2. For all those things which mine hand made and all those things have been, saith the Lord, and to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Amen. Buddy, when you know you've got God's word and it humbles you and it kind of uh, amazes you because, man, you know you got responsibility now. You got straight from God everything you need. And so now you ain't got no excuses. <laughs> Amen. And too much is given, much is required. Amen? Amen. And so God-fearing students of the Word of God, buddy, uh, the Lord is going to be with that person, and he's going to show them some things that he ain't going to show other people. That's right. And so um, if you've got that right humble attitude and a healthy fear of the Word of God, amen, amen, uh, So that it, you, you, you know, you tremble at the responsibility. It's a scary thing. Amen. To know that, yeah, I'm going to stand in front of God someday. And he's going to ask me, now, what did you do with all that I gave you and with my words I gave you? 
you know, you knew whereof you spoke, and you knew what I had to say, and yet you didn't give it to nobody. You didn't try to disciple nobody. You didn't try to tell nobody. Oops, <laughs> it could be embarrassing come payday. <laughs> and God does hide truth from Mr. Worldly Wise and proud people. Uh, so that they don't seem to see it. You know, isn't it amazing? Here God had all these wonderful prophecies how someday he'd send his Savior Son. He'd be born in a town called Bethlehem and all these details. And yet when he was born, uh, sure wasn't nobody looking for him. <laughs> You'd think them Jews would have stayed up every night uh, looking for him and looking in the stars like the wise men did even. I mean, but no, he had some, sh some wise men come from the east people who lived around Jesus didn't have a clue. And then uh, when the wise men came to the king of the Jews, Herod at the time in Jerusalem, so they went to the city capital. I mean, surely they, he'll know where the king of the Jews is born. But to their surprise, he said, no, I don't know nothing about it, but let me get the Jews out here and they'll, they'll tell us where he's supposed to be born. And he said, hey, fellas, uh, does the Bible tell us where he's supposed Well, they said, well, sure, it's just right over five miles away. <laughs> it's right there in Bethlehem, just down the street. And so Herod tells the wise guys, and then sure enough, they go out, and there's a star standing there. Takes them right to the place where the kids lay in there, amen? Uh, so the Lord had to have some angels tell shepherds, and they were there to welcome baby Jesus when he came into the world. So to whom much is given, much is required. And see, the problem with the Jews at that time was, as a group of people, they were very proud and cocky. They didn't have that humble, humbleness or trembling at the word of God that's really required. Amen? So God hides truth from worldly wise people and proud people. Look at Luke chapter 10 and 21. Luke 10, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, now look at Jesus, he's real happy. What's he bragging about? In that hour, Jesus uh, rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. See, sometimes it's not the eggheads that God wants to know things. It's the people that have that simple childlike baby faith he shows things to. I told you many times how I'm right here at the pizza hut in Toledo getting a pizza. Joy went inside to get it. I'm sitting in the car with my little boy, Jared, who's just a little boy at the time. And I'm sitting there and I'm singing an old Negro spiritual that my grandfather's brothers all used to sing. I got shoes, you got shoes. All God's children got shoes. When we get to heaven, gonna put on our shoes. We're gonna walk all over God's heaven. Heaven, gonna walk all over God's heaven. I got a crown, you got a crown. All God's children got a crown. And my little boy comes up to me and he says, Daddy, we ain't going to wear no shoes in heaven. And he's, and I mean, just as serious as a heart attack. And I'm thinking, what? I said, well, we're not going to wear shoes in heaven, Jared? He said, no, Dad, we're not going to wear no shoes in heaven. I said, well, how do you know that? Now, this is a kid, see, that we don't have no television in our home. Uh, and the only thing we have is a radio and uh, cassette tapes. So he's listening all every night when he goes to bed. He's listening to Pete Ruckman's ad lib commentary where Dr. Ruckman is telling the whole stories of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in a story form. And he's made it up as he goes along. And he, he'll say... Uh, all right, boys, give him his rewards. And then he takes the uh, knife and fork and spoon drawer out of the kitchen and dumps it in the floor. You know, when you hear all this crash, you hear all this spoons and stuff fall. <laughs> he tries to, he made it, you know, he made these sound effects to try to illustrate the different Bible stories. 
So my boy says, we're not going to wear shoes in heaven, Dad. I says, well, how do you know that, Jared? Because God told Moses, take off your shoes, Moses. You're on holy ground. Amen. And I said to myself, whoo, that's a blessing. God's revealed these things to babes because my little boy just taught me something I didn't know. And in our church, you know, you'll have all kinds of fellows come through the door and hang out church a year or two. And next thing you know, you know, that God's called them to preach or something. So we come up with 101 questions you have to answer or you're not even going to be entertained to be ordained in our church. And believe you me, that's one of the questions. Well, we wear shoes in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Because that's true, isn't it? That God did talk to Moses at the burning bush and told him, take your shoes off, boy. You're on holy ground. Isn't that a blessing? And here Jesus said, yes. Boy, I'm so glad. And so, and the Bible even tells us that the reason Jesus seemed to talk with parables really was so that people who don't know God or believe God won't be able to get what he's saying. It was really to keep a lot of the secrets of the kingdom where only God's children should be able to know them and figure them out. And so that's very interesting that Jesus said that there. Because if you know Luke 10, here Jesus has sent the 70 disciples out two by two, going out into the cities, knocking on doors, telling them Jesus is coming. And Jesus, when they come back to check in with Jesus, he said, wow, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And, um, and they said, wow, Lord, even the spirits are uh, subject in your name, verse 20. And he said, well, boys, don't be getting excited because you can cast devils out of people. You just be excited your names are written in heaven. See, you can get sidetracked sometimes chasing spirits and all kinds of stuff. But you need to stay centered on the most important stuff. Amen. And that's it. Your name's in heaven. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. <laughs> Don't get so busy chasing devils that you lose sight of what you're really all about. <laughs> get, getting people saved. Amen. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. We read here in 1 Corinthians 126 recently. Apostle Paul reminded this church with all their problems. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. See, God often uses the simple things. Verse 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus is what we're here to glory about. Not our edumacation or anything else <laughs> of this world. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and pick it up at 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he, that he may be wise. Fear the wisdom of this world. I mean, for the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours. And so we have a lot to brag about in Jesus and knowing Jesus and having his word. And that's why we really we have to pity those people who don't have a sure word and don't know for sure what it is. And so they got to retranslate it, retranslate it, retranslate it, and they still can't get it right. <laughs> because it can't be continually made to their liking. See, that's the problem. 
I personally uh, had the opportunity, the uh, uh, William Tyndale bookstore uh, publisher of Nashville, Tennessee, sent some men up to Green, uh, Greensburg, Pennsylvania one time. And uh, they sent the word out to all of us pastors living in Pennsylvania at the time. They said, uh, we want you to come to a meeting. These men are here that help work on the new uh, international version and the new King James Version. And so you'll have a chance to talk to these men that helped uh, make that translation. So it was a free breakfast, so I went. And uh, we enjoyed the breakfast. And I took uh, somebody with me. I can't remember who at the time. But we had the opportunity after the end of their little speech, trying to get you to buy their newest ver Bible versions, uh, to answer questions. So I, I, I raised my hand and said, why did you change what was written in the King James where it says that they saw the form of the fourth man was like the Son of God? Why did you change that? The form of the fourth man was as one of the gods. Why didn't you write it the way the King James says and say the fourth man was like the Son of God? Like the King James has always said for 400 years. And it was amazing. It blew me away. As this man said, always, fellas, if you see our version says something and the King James is different, always go to the King James. And I said, ay, 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 ay. whoa, what's going on here? These guys come here to sell us their new versions, but this guy's being totally honest. And he tells us, he says, to be honest, I don't know why we changed it. But because I was working with other men, if they said this is what we're going to do and we're going to change it like this, we could have raised our hand and objected. But because they all wanted it, I guess I went along with them and I didn't raise my hand and I went along with it too. See, he's almost admitting like the devil got in there and blinded them so, so that they made mistakes. So after the meeting was over, I went up to this man, of course, and I said, hey, I'm kind of interested in what all you had to say that you actually told everybody that if there's a difference between the King James and the New International Version or else the New King James, is always go with the Old King James. Tell me more of why you said that. And he told me straight up. He said, do you know Ted Leptis? And of course, I didn't at the time, but yet I didn't, I didn't know him well, but I did know who Ted was. Because I met Ted then the year before at a meeting in Washington, D.C., and Ted was a student at uh, one of the major universities in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is where the major seminaries and universities are that train all the Catholic, e Episcopal, and high up educated people. And Ted Leptis was a student there, and he was telling me, I met him at this big meeting uh, in Washington, and uh, he came right up to us because he knew that we were handing out literature on the King James Bible. And he said, hey, I go to this university. I'm a student and I've been working with uh, some of the big uh, King James defenders. And I've written the introduction in this book of a King James uh, Bible scholar. And uh, he let me write the introduction to his new book. And uh, I'm going to this university. Well, anyhow, he was in that university and he was teaching Lutheran seminarians why they better stick with the old King James Bible and not go with the new versions. I mean, this was blowing my mind. I didn't know God had anybody in those camps and in those circles trying to teach the people, stick with the old book that really your whole denomination was based on because when Luther wrote his German Bible, it fit the King James 100%, but it was just German and not King James. And, um, and here he was, he was espounding that position and helping hold that truth in a denomination that was, man, a denomination as goofy as all get out with their baby baptisms and uh, ordaining women now and now ordaining homosexuals and marrying homosexuals and just whoa <laughs> almost as Catholic as a daughter harlot of the Catholic Church could be 
There ain't much difference today between Lutherans and Catholics at all. But yet, even in a circle like that, God had some people that believe like we do about which Bible should we go with. And so that was amazing to me. And so I asked this fellow about this Daniel verse. And he told me, yes, well, Ted Leptis was one of my students in one of my classes. And he kept holding my feet to the fire out. Wait a minute. The King James is from a totally different Greek text. So that's why there's a difference in the King James Version and the newer versions. And he said, when I was on the translating committee, he said, Ted hadn't quite reached me with that truth, but he said, I finally realized I was wrong and Ted was right. And the King James is the best English translation we have of the Greek Textus Receptus, the Reformation Greek text. And she says, so he says, I finally come off the fence on the right side and I'm letting everybody know that even though I helped write it and these people are going to pay us to go out and try to get people to buy their version, if they have any contradictions that they spot to go back to the King James. And I said, whoa, this was interesting. I'm so glad I came. <laughs> Amen? So I've got a few of these... Uh, I thought, you know, we talk about this stuff, but to be honest, you can take my word for it, but if you will just sit down, I for sure want these kids to have a copy of these. these uh, this, this is a little chart that shows you, word for word, a lot of the changes, amen, that the new versions have made. And, of course, the truth is it's a totally different Greek text. Uh, our King James, see, like these new versions, they'll say, we're going to make this new version, and we're going to make it more true to the Greek original. Well, number one, see, there is no Greek original. See, God, in his sovereignty, made sure they got lost a long time ago. <laughs> if we had the original, what would people do with them? Uh oh, they kiss them, they put them in a shrine, right. they make idols out of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we need to know the difference. Because the truth is, yes, there's a totally different Greek. And based on that different Greek, we have different English <laughs> words that these new versions have come out with. Amen? So, uh, anyhow, there's a couple of pamphlets that are to help us when we do talk to people about their other versions, to help them see what's wrong with their version. Well, if you're number one, you're, you're, you're taking and removing the Lordship of Christ. You're taking and removing the blood of Jesus. You're taking and changing verses that you have no business changing. It shows that maybe there's a devil behind the new versions. <laughs> maybe he influenced some man somewhere and he made a different Greek text that said a different Greek word. Because it just don't match ours. I, I had a, again, you got to remember, I came out of Kentucky, and one day my mentor, feeling his ignorance, uh, he, got in a, he got in a spell where he read a book somewhere. So he quoted this book, and he got in the pulpit and said, now this word in the, in the Greek is this. And I knew he didn't know no Greek. And believe me, I know very little. You know, I know the Greek that runs the restaurant down the street. So I know very little Greek, but I know a little bit. When I was in school, I learned it's easy to learn the alphabet, alphabet of gamma, delta. You know, you can learn a little bit. Anybody can learn a little bit. <laughs> and so I had a uh, Barry interlinear in New Testament that where it, it's, it, it's all written in Greek, and then underneath the Greek, it's got the English words. And I could easily go to that. I had a copy of the King James Greek. And when I, my, my hillbilly uh, mentor brother down there in Kentucky, he read, he read off some word in some book. And I said, hey, I want you to know that I looked that up and it's not true. And the next church service, I brought my Greek interlinear with me in the service. Because I said, I bet you he's going to do something like that, try to pull that off again. Because he knew we're all hillbillies. No, ain't nobody knows no Greek in our church. And he did it again. Now this word in the Greek. So I immediately turned to the verse he said, and I, 
And after church, I went right up to him and said, see there, look, here's what it is. You're wrong. That is not what the king, that is not what the Greek word is even. But see, people forget, that's right, the new versions have a different Greek. Jerome, uh, Ignatius, there are different fellas, Irenaeus. There's different fellas that we believe help change the versions uh, so that when they find those old Greek manuscripts, they think, oh, I'm going to write a new Bible here and get people to buy my Bible because I'm going to translate it from this new manuscript I found. And that's just a bit what's been going on. And since the King James was written in 1611 to today, there's been over 1,000 new versions that people have made. And some of them, like, well, they printed one or two editions, but then after two years, they just quit printing it because nobody would buy them. <laughs> because uh, they're not God's word, that's why. You know what I mean? All right, let's pray. Lord, again, help, help us to believe the Bible, Lord, and help us to know that, yes, uh, we've got your word. We don't need the, the newest thing come out of Nashville, and we don't have to spend a lot of money. That's why your old King James is not copyrighted. Lord, you want it copied and copied and recopied. And it's been that way for centuries because you want your word out there so people can be saved, churches can be built. And you're coming soon, and we know Jesus wouldn't switch and go to a new version just before he comes back. So help us to stay true, and in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.